from Hollywood. It's time now for Edmund O'Brien as... Johnny Dollar. I received a message you called. This is Roy Underwood. Oh, yes, Mr. Underwood. I've been hired by the Plymouth Insurance Company to look into the jewelry you reported stolen. That's what the message said. I uh, wondered when I could see you, find out if you have any idea who stole it. I'll be in my apartment for the rest of the night, and I'll tell you everything you need to know. I know who stole it, and I think I know where you can find her. Yeah, you make it sound very simple, Mr. Underwood. I'll see you after dinner. Say 8.30. <laughs> Edmund O'Brien in the transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Plymouth Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Virginia town matter. Expense account item one, $20, transportation and incidentals between Hartford and the Hotel Bentley, New York City. I contacted the policyholder, Roy Underwood, and at 8.45 that first night, I arrived at the 63rd Street apartment. The meeting was not in private. We can go in the study. Well, maybe I shouldn't have interrupted you tonight. Oh, won't take long. I'll be right back. A little business. But what am I going to do with him? He just sits there with that character and ignores me. Oh, sure, Ellie, sure. I'll talk to you about it in a minute. Now, excuse me. I hope you'll pardon my uh, not introducing her to you. I will. Gets a little out of hand sometimes. Uh, Here. There's whiskey on the table if you want it. No, thanks. This jewelry you reported stolen. I have a description. Will you look at it? Tell me if it's right. Yeah. Yes, this is correct. It was stolen by a woman named Virginia Town. You're sure of that? Oh, yes, I'm sure of it. She was here at a party, very much like this one. I saw her leave with them. You didn't try to stop her? Of course I did. It's not my responsibility to place a thief under arrest. Did you notify the police? No, I was going to, but I thought better of it next morning. I wanted to give her a chance to think twice, too. Uh, if she'll bring him back, I won't swear out a complaint. The pieces are all women's jewelry. Two bracelets and three rings. Yes, I buy odd pieces when I can at a reasonable price. How did she manage to get hold of them? They were in my dresser drawer. She put them on. I told her to take them off. She refused and, and left. Mm-hmm. You mentioned on the phone that you thought you knew where I could find this Virginia town. Well, I'm not sure, you understand. I tried to phone her at her apartment, but she'd moved out. Well, then I called her closest friend, a girl called Frances Adams. And she said she didn't know where Virginia was, but I think she was lying. I think Virginia was right there. Where do I find this Frances Adams? Oh, her flat's in Lexington, near 40th. Uh, she's a Czech girl at the top hat and works till four in the morning. I'll give you her address. Before I left, I was shown a posed photograph of Virginia Town inscribed to Roy with more thanks than I can ever say. I didn't keep the photograph, but the vision of the face in it stayed with me. On Roy Underwood's hunch where Virginia Town might be, I cabbed to the address of a friend on Lexington. Phil. I didn't take... Oh. Miss Virginia Town? Who are you? My name is Dollar. I'm an insurance investigator. I'm here to talk to you about some jewelry owned by Mr. Roy Underwood. What? May I come in, please? Yes. Roy sent you here? I'm working for the insurance company. Roy said he thought you might be found here. And he said the jewelry was his. That's right. He said you stole it. But that's not true. He gave it to me. One of the bracelets for Christmas last year, the other for my birthday, and the rings at other times. You have proof of that? Proof? He knows he gave them to me. I said proof. My instinct was that something like this might be the case. But the people who hired me can't consider the personal angles. I should have expected something like this. Underwood has proof of ownership. He insured the pieces to himself, and he undoubtedly has bills of sale. You'll have to give it all back, or he'll go to the police. I can't give it all back. I sold one of the bracelets. 
Well, you can buy it again. No, Casey. I couldn't possibly. I sold it at a low price because I didn't have any money and I had to live. You must have friends. Can't you borrow enough to get it back? I have friends. But they're the ones I had before I met Roy. One's a hat check girl like I was. Another's a cab driver. That's who I thought was at the door when you knocked. They aren't the kind of people who can scrape up $1,500 at the drop of a hat. Is that what you need? At least that. Not much of a market for things like that bracelet. I had to take a cut price. That or wait months for a buyer. But I had a right to sell it. It was mine. I didn't steal it. He said you did. He said you took it and the rest of the stuff out of his dresser drawer. That's not true. There was a party going on? Yes. Did you go into his room? Yes, to tell him that I didn't want to see him anymore. He laughed at me and said I'd come back to him any time he wanted me to. I guess this is what he meant. If you were in there alone with him, it's his word against yours. As I said, he has proof of ownership. I'm afraid you're really in trouble. Unless I crawl back. That'll be Phil. Just a second, Phil. I don't know how he's going to take the news. There's nothing to do but tell him. Phil's last name was Kelly, and it matched his appearance. He was over 40, red hair beginning to gray. As he listened, his heavy, freckled hands started to clench and unclench. And the look in his eyes convinced me more than her words that Virginia Town was telling the truth. The rest of the story came out. Underwood had gotten her into a few chorus lines after he talked her out of a job in a nightclub. Not because she had any outstanding talent except beauty, but because of his influence. When he stopped using that to her advantage, there was no more work. Until I finally got it through my empty head that the farther in debt I got, the more he enjoyed it. So I stopped it the only way I knew how. I told him it was finished, and it was. And she's no thief. She sold only what was hers. She didn't steal them gigaws. It's not what I think, Kelly. It's what the police can pile up in the way of evidence. Well, then, the truth of it is, I sold the bracelet. I stole it from her. I stole it from her, and that's why she can't give it back. Tell him that and see what can pile up against me. Now, wait a minute, Kelly. Phil, now you're being ridiculous. No, I'm not. There's no reason to bother Mr. Dollar with all this. It's his job to return the jewelry if he can, and that's all. But you're not going to see Virginia arrested because of the personal feelings of this scum now, are you? No, I'm not, if I can help it. Well, that's better. What are you going to do, Mr. Dollar? Well, I'm going to give you some time to try to raise the money. I'm overstepping my bounds, but I think you deserve a break. I'll stall Underwood for two days. Tell him I haven't found you. That's tomorrow and the next day. That's the best I can do. That'll be time enough. And I'll deliver his blasted gigaws myself with a slug in the teeth to boot. I don't know how to thank you, Mr. Dollar. Forget it. I'll check back with you tomorrow. <laughs> I felt justified in letting personal feelings rule me for that short time at least because I was sure the company wouldn't want to be used in any kind of a blackmail scheme. I met Frances Adams, the girl with whom Virginia was sharing the apartment when I checked the progress the following afternoon. When I went back that evening, a couple of hundred dollars had come in and Kelly was out trying to raise more. I stayed there alone with Virginia waiting for him to come back and I caught myself thinking less about my part of it more about the way she was facing what could be in her future. She was uncomplaining and almost naively brave about accepting the possible results of the mistake she had made. I returned to my hotel and called Underwood. I knew I was on thin ice when I stalled him one more day, but it had to end that third night when she calmly gave me the latest development. We couldn't buy the bracelet if we had $5,000, Johnny. I don't get it. It's been cut up. Even one of the larger diamonds has been cut. When did this come out? This afternoon, about four. Why didn't you call me then? Because I didn't want anybody else to be here when I told you about it. Well, that doesn't seem to make my next move any easier. I'll have to go to Underwood tomorrow morning. I know you will. That's why I wanted to tell you this way. Because the next time I see you, you won't be my friend. You'll be just another man with some evidence. I've grown used to you as a friend, Johnny. I'm sorry it had to happen this way. No matter how it happened, I'm glad it did. You think we could forget all of it? I wish you'd take me someplace. We can try. Where do you want to go? Any place. Just have a couple of drinks. I don't care. I just want to go someplace with you. Come on, get up. Sure. Hey. What, Charlie? Hello.
Hello, Underwood. Come in. What was this nonsense you were talking on the phone? That you thought the insurance company would be willing not to prosecute if the loss was made up? Who's going to make up the loss? Forget it, Underwood. Do you think that's any way to stop crime? I said forget it. I certainly intend to. I've got your stuff. I was willing to show some leniency if everything was returned, but I'd be a fool. The missing to... piece is listed as worth $2,400. If you'll sign this claim, I'll turn it into the company. Here's my pen. Thank you. Can't afford to be taken advantage of by every beautiful young thing that happens along. Here you are. Thanks. I want to thank you for what you've done. It's nothing but a job, Underwood. Nothing but a job. It was a quarter after 12 when I left Underwood's apartment. I had to make my own report on the matter to the police, and that took until 2.30. I then had lunch and went back to my hotel to pack, planning to leave for Hartford as soon as possible. It wasn't very soon. Come. Mr. Dollar? Yeah? Lieutenant Brinker, homicide. Hmm. What's up, Lieutenant? You made a report earlier this afternoon on some jewelry owned by one Roy Underwood that had been stolen and then partially returned. I did. I guess we need another statement from you. Stuff is missing again, and Roy Underwood has been shot to death. Come on. We will return you to the second act of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Gay, tuneful, funny, and laden with loot. It's the hour-long Sing It Again, which comes to you every Saturday on most of these same CBS stations. Jan Murray makes for the laughs and buzzes listeners from coast to coast, asking the solution to the Phantom Voice mystery, offering $1,000 in cash, if you get it right. Be listening for Jan Murray and Sing It Again later tonight on CBS. Now with our star, Edmund O'Brien, we return you to the second act of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. On the way to headquarters, the Lieutenant Brinker, I learned that Underwood had been killed in his apartment. The report had been phoned in by the building manager at 2.20 that afternoon when he heard the screaming of Alice Breen. She was the drunken young woman I had run into the first night on the case. She was being held as a material witness. In spite of the fact that the jewelry was again missing, the police took a dim view of her story that she'd entered the apartment and found Underwood dead. As far as I was concerned, there were a number of things I wish I hadn't done and a number of things I wish I hadn't said in my first report to the police. Now, you stated that after three days of searching, you found the suspect in the original theft this morning, recovered the stolen property, minus one item, and returned it to the owner. Do you think that between the time you found this Virginia town and started back to Underwood's apartment, somebody could have learned about the jewelry and followed you? I'm not sure. If somebody knew about it and planned to steal it, I don't know why they didn't steal it from the town girl. According to your report, this Virginia town told you she considered the property in question to be a series of gifts. That's what she said. If that were true, do you think she would have conspired to arm robbery to regain it? I don't know. I don't know. Why are you working these possibilities over, Lieutenant? I'm trying to eliminate them as possibilities. This Alice Breen, we know she was involved with Underwood. We're told he was pretty ruthless in getting rid of women he was through with. The motive of passion would be easier to work with. I haven't heard a whole statement. She hasn't made a decent one. But what she told the manager doesn't jibe with what she told us. Lieutenant, I can recheck the town girl's statements and maybe get something if you'll let me do it alone. Why should we do that? Well, you don't have to, but she knows my sympathies are with her. I think she was getting a bad deal from Underwood, and she knows I think so. You've got a good record here in New York, Dollar. If you think you might do better alone, I guess I can take a chance on you. You've got quite a bit at stake yourself, haven't you? What do you mean by that? I sent some men to Virginia Town's place. She wasn't there, but the girl she lives with was. What she told my men makes it sound like you found her before you said you're dead. You can still take a chance on me, Lieutenant. I hope so, Dollar. By the time I got to the Lexington Avenue apartment, the roommate, Francis Adams, was gone, too. But through his cab company, I did locate Phil Kelly. I swear I didn't even know about it. 
I was brought up to mourn the dead, but if you'll excuse me, I can't bring myself to it this time. Well, that's hardly the point. Where's Virginia? I don't know. Where's Francis Adams? I don't know that either. This is a work day. I've been on the go since morning. Where would Virginia go? You must have an idea. From what I've seen, I wouldn't be at all surprised if she wasn't looking as hard for you as you are for her. Have you thought of that? Why would she do that? You don't know. Well, come. She has the strongest motive for the killing so far. If I can't find her, I'll have to tell the police that's why she's hiding. Now, that isn't so at all. What other reason would she have? They'll ask me that, and I'll have to answer them. She's no murderess. Well, she's acting mighty like one. Get into the cab. I'll take you to her. That's the door there. I won't go in with you if you don't mind. I don't know she's there. She's there. Okay. I've got a check on you, Kelly. Who is it, Phil? It's Dollar. Let me in. Dollar. Why did you come here? Who told you where I was? What are you doing here? It's none of your business. You did your job, didn't you? You told me last night that no matter what your personal feelings were, you had to do your job. Well, you did it. Why can't you leave me alone now? If he was still alive, I couldn't. Still alive? The police have been looking for you. So I Underwood's dead? You didn't know? Of course I didn't know. Johnny... Why are you hiding? Because I... Because I didn't want to be arrested. You told me Roy was going to swear out a complaint. He didn't have a chance to. Starting at about 1 o'clock this afternoon, where have you been? Here. Johnny, please. How did you get here? What difference does that did make? Kelly bring you? No. And how did he know where you were? Johnny, I came here because you said Roy could swear out a complaint and it was his word against mine and that somebody in my spot didn't have much of a chance. I wish you'd been as truthful with me. What do you mean? You've lied to me. No, I haven't. Yes, you have. Now I realize they were stupid, obvious lies. And I believed them because I wanted to believe them. Johnny... You told me Underwood gave you those things as presents, Christmas, birthdays, and so on. That's true. The police have learned that he bought all of the pieces on the same day at an auction, year before last. I didn't know that. I don't care when he bought them, he gave them to me. You didn't tell me until last night that the bracelet you sold had been cut up. The police learned that the jeweler who bought it told you he was going to cut it up. All right, I did lie. You offered me two days to try and think of something to do? I gave you three, and I'm in trouble because of them. Is that all they mean? Yeah. Now that's all they mean. Johnny, how can you say that? Because your lies have made you a lot less beautiful than I thought you were. Johnny... I have to clear myself with the police. Not only about robbery, but about murder now. The only way I can do that is to take you in. Let you clear up your lies, if you can. I'm sorry, Johnny. About what? That it had to be this way. I'm sorry. You're ready to go. There's a cab waiting. It was a silent trip to police headquarters in Kelly's taxi, and Lieutenant Brinker allowed me the privilege of being present while he questioned Virginia for two hours. When it was finished, Alice Breen, the material witness, was released, and I walked out of the building into a murky New York evening. Dollar. You still here, Kelly? Where else would I be? You want to drive me back to my hotel? Sure, get in. When's she coming out? I don't think she is, Kelly. Why not? Well, they're building up quite a case against her. What about? Not killing that scum? Yeah. She didn't do it, and you know it. I don't know, Kelly. Well, I do. I know where she came from, and I know what she is. She had nothing for so long that when that Underwood gave her his line and made his rotten promises, she thought it was heaven opening up to her. I know, because she told me so, with her eyes shining. Can't you see you've just exposed her motive? She had nothing when he found her, and he was going to send her back with less. A prison term. She didn't kill him. Why do you keep saying that, Kelly? Because I killed him. The motive you've given her was mine. Do you think I'd stand by and let him send her to prison? Do you think I'd do that? Knowing her since she was a baby? 
and a mother and father before. Kelly, do you know where the jewelry is? Yes, I know. Where is it? I'll tell you in good time. I want you to take me in there now. The police have the jewelry, Kelly. They're lying to me. She told them where she'd taken it after she killed him, and they found it there. Maybe I'd better get another cab, huh? Expense account item two, $230, miscellaneous. Item three, same as item one, transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $270. Remarks? Please make the check payable to Charles Hagen, attorney for the defense in the case of the people versus Virginia town. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role and is written by Gil Dodd with music by Wilbur Hatch. Edmund O'Brien's latest picture is the Paramount Pictures production, The Redhead and the Cowboy. Featured in tonight's cast were Ramsey Hill, Gene Wood, Virginia Gregg, Jack Moyles, and Ed Begley. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, was transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Dan Coverley inviting you to join us next week at this time when Edmund O'Brien returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. If words alone could stem the tide of rampaging communism, it would be fine, for talk is cheap. But no amount of sidewalk gossip, intellectual discussion, or silver-tongued oratory has any effect on the ever-surging threat of red aggression. But there are things a communist does respect. He respects atom bombs. He respects wide-winged, globe-circling bombers. He respects steel-girded ships of the line. He respects well-conditioned, well-equipped fighting men. Yes, this makes sense to him. So... Let's make him respect us by providing these things in great numbers. To do this takes money, and we can help provide that money by buying United States defense bonds. The month of May has been proclaimed Defense Bond Month, and every American citizen is being asked to get on the bond wagon. Sign up for the regular purchase of bonds at your bank or place of employment. If you're already doing that, try to buy an extra bond. This has to be, for remember... Only talk is cheap. Just ten years ago this month, our government started the sale of savings bonds. A few short months later, these same bonds were known as war bonds. Today, with the world suspended in a state of raw nerve existence, we are asked to buy defense bonds. Let's buy them all we can and now. Help provide the weapons of defense and security so that in a few short months, they will still be known as defense bonds, not war bonds. A successful bank robbery gets knocked flat by a schoolboy's baseball on Gangbusters tonight. Don't ask me how it's done, but Gangbusters always dramatizes a true police story, and this story... The case of a game of ball will be told by the California sheriff who knew the boy and captured the robbers. Be listening for Gangbusters on most of these same CBS stations tonight. Stay tuned now for five minutes of the latest news. This is CBS, where you laugh at Jack Benny every Sunday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>